Good morning, my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you guys today? It is, I'm still tired, but I wanted to get up and get moving. Last night was a great time. That concert was a blast. Let me tell you what happened after I put my camera away and started just enjoying the night, not as a videographer, but as a friend and fan of the band. They played all night. They played so many songs. It was so great to hear. Songs I never thought they would play. And then towards the end, that band was always known for, when I used to watch them, they would always play Cheap Trick Surrender. And right at the end of the night, I start hearing that song playing, and I'm out in the crowd singing along, and Stefan looks over and sees me and points to me and goes like that. And I'm like, oh no, he doesn't want me to go on stage, does he? And I'm still singing along, and he does it again, so I go, you know what, forget this. I didn't come all the way out here not to do this, so I hopped up on stage, grabbed a microphone, and I, uh, I got to sing Cheap Trick Surrender, which was awesome considering that the lyrics in there say, with my KISS records out, and you have the drummer of KISS playing for you. So never in my life did I think at some point I would have a man who played piano, keyboard, harmonica for Guns N' Roses, a guy who plays drums for KISS. I never in my life thought I would have some of those musicians playing and me getting to help perform a song with them, but I did, and so that made my night. And I got a free Sunset Winos hat at the end of the night, which was pretty awesome. There you go. So I'm going to hop in the shower, and then I think we're going to head back out to, I think, the winery. Say goodbye to all the guys, and uh, I'm going to make my way back because Jaw's coming home today. Breck's bringing, bringing him over to my place, and then we're going to go out and do a vlog. I don't want to tell you what we're going to do, but I halfway considered on my drive home stopping off in Guadalupe Dunes and trying to look at the... Old Lost City of DeMille again, but you know, I think I'll save that for when Brett goes. He really wants to see that, so I think I'm just going to do a straight drive home, and then we are going to go vlogging with Breck. I think we're going to go to Vasquez Rocks. I'm pretty sure, so I'm going to get the shower. You guys can hang out, and Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. And what else was pretty cool is I got invited to the after party. Went up there, partied with all the band, all the, you know, all the major friends and everything in the group. And I got to have some of Eric Singer's birthday cake. They had a, well, Eric's birthday was last week, and the owner of the vineyard here loves Eric, and I guess Eric has helped get a, uh, they're putting a performance venue on the grounds here, like a thousand-seater venue, and Eric helped with that. So they got him a snare drum-looking cake that I took a picture of, and I will post right here. And I got to enjoy some of it. Eric cut all the cake pieces for everyone, handed it out, so pretty cool night for me. All right, let's hit the road. We have a long drive. It's like three and a half hour drive. And if you have no idea what any of that was before all this that I was talking about, go look up the date before today's vlog on my channel and or go look up Sunset Wino Super Group at Rava Wines and you'll see the vlog that I'm talking about. So let's hit the road. We're gonna go back and see the Joster. I know you guys all have missed him. And so have I. And if someday some other vlogger decides to vlog my trip out here, I was in room 109. <laughs> So at the concert last night, a friend of mine that I uh, met through Stefan, Robert, was telling me that he had been watching the James Dean um, memorial vlog that I did because I had actually posted it the day he was driving out to Paso Robles. And he said he was passing all those same sites along the way. So he stopped at the James Dean memorial and I said, did you see my sunglasses there? And he said, no. He said, I, I looked for them in fact. He said there were other sunglasses out there but yours were gone. So. We hypothesize somebody that watches this channel went out and grabbed them. Which I guess I'm okay with. Well, speaking of, I was just driving up upon the Jack Ranch Cafe and I figured I'm gonna stop in and have breakfast real quick. Oh, that's awesome. Yep, I think this is the perfect place to sit. That's interesting, they sell uh, copies of his last speeding ticket for a dollar and newspaper copies for four. Well, I went ahead and ordered the uh, ham and cheese omelet. So weird sitting here looking at that picture. 
knowing that not even a mile away is where it all happened. Check out all the merchandise they have. Wow, they even have t-shirts. Interesting. Oh wow, there's Clint Eastwood visiting here. How about that? That's crazy, if you look at that picture, that was actually taken right here. All right, there it is, looks great. That was an absolutely great meal. Since we're here, I figured I'd just take a look at it one more time. Now let's hit the road back to LA. And there's the memorial right there. And of course, here's again Blackwell's Corner. Gee, I wonder if they ever found oil out here. Good grief, man. Well, I just got home, and first things first, a little bit of business. This lens that I got for uh, for the future, garbage. I'm sending it back. It's uh, this one's just this one's broken. <laughs> When you go to focus, you can hear it grinding to focus. Um, sometimes when you just move the uh, the focus right here to zoom or anything, all of a sudden the thing will just start like jittering and stuff like that. So I just emailed the guy and said, dude, this, the motor's bad in this. I got to get my money back. So he said, okay, just pack it back up and I'll pay the shipping and everything. So going to do that tomorrow. And I came home and found some Amazon gifts. Of course, for Jaw. Thank you, Ruth Ann Churchman. He will totally appreciate this. That was very nice of you. And then he got some of his other favorites right here from Bridget Doerr. She says she is a psychic medium at Above Life channel on YouTube. I connect in kindness to the wonderful energy from the afterlife. She found me through the graveyard videos. Right on. Thank you. Thank you so much for sending something for Ja. That was so sweet of you. Well, there I got the... Free camera the guy sent and the lens packed up to send back. That's the uh, that's the risk you always take with buying used equipment. And it's why I don't really like to do it. But it was also a $900 camera lens. So I just, uh, you know, when you buy something used, it's probably best to do it off the Amazon site. Because even if you buy it used, you can, you can return it and get your money back. They protect you that way. So in this case, I lucked out. Yeah, we all missed that face, didn't we? We all missed that face. Well, Jaw, it's good to have you home. We all missed you. Did you miss me? Look who's home. Everyone's buddy. Came attacking me when he got in. You about ran a half block to see me, didn't you? All right, well, Breck and I are headed out. Hate to leave Jaw, but it's just for a short time. I think we, I think we're actually going to go over to Breck's house tomorrow for a special vlog. But um, we're going to head out to Vasquez Rocks now, and what we're hoping to find is a couple of classic scenes from a, well, a movie that you probably couldn't get made now, and you almost didn't get made then, the 1974 classic Blazing Saddles. And there's our old pal Breck doing the driving so that I can work the camera safely. And I know a lot of people call Blazing Saddles a Mel Brooks film, but Breck, did you know that Mel Brooks was not originally the man who was going to direct Blazing Saddles? I did not know that. Well, we've made it out here. Are you starting to feel like you're back in... 1874 yet Well here we are now it's a state park and it probably was even then But this is one of the 
few scenes out here in Vasquez Rocks that they film Blazing Saddles. Now, Blazing Saddles, for a little background story, was originally written in 1971, and the writer of it sold it to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers asked Alan Arkin to direct it, and he had cast James Earl Jones as the sheriff. For whatever reason, the script they had didn't take off, and eventually Mel Brooks was offered the script. Mel Brooks took it on, but like Mel Brooks said, what you always do whenever you do any kind of movie is you immediately get the script and get rid of the writer because the writers are just the problem. But in this case, he actually really liked the writer, so he made the original writer of the screenplay, as well as himself and three other people, the head writers, and they were gonna reconstruct this Western into what was originally called Black Bart into what would be known as Blazing Saddles, turning it into basically an 1874 comedy set in 1974. So one of those writers that Mel Brooks said he immediately hired was a club comic, a nightclub comic named Richard Pryor. And he said, contrary to popular belief, Richard Pryor actually mainly wrote Mongo scenes. He really gravitated towards Mongo, so a lot of the racial jokes weren't even his. But they said originally that Mel Brooks kind of, his idea was he wanted Richard Pryor to be the sheriff. However, Warner Brothers just saw way too many instances where Richard was, uh, let's just say, um, irresponsible. He would disappear during the writing of the movie and end up in Detroit. So they ended up then wanting Flip Wilson and then eventually Cleavon Little. Now, Gene Wilder actually said he was originally offered the part of Hedley Lamar. He said he didn't see himself doing that part though. And he said he really wanted to be the Waco kid. And Mel Brooks said, yeah, but I want like an old grizzled veteran to be, uh, to be Waco kid. But in the end, he ended up going with Gene Wilder because the person that he, he originally offered the part to said he couldn't bring himself to say those kind of words. Say the N word, basically. This was not a racist comedy, but it was a very racial comedy. So, became a, well, not something that Warner Brothers exactly knew they were getting themselves into because as it was written, what Warner Brothers forgot to realize was that Mel Brooks had final cut. So, when they sent him a letter saying, you gotta remove this and you gotta remove that and you gotta remove, that, he just took all of their suggestions, wadded them up and threw them away said he knew what was funny. One of the things they wanted him to delete was when I was a kid, what I thought was maybe the funniest scene in any movie, it was the, the bean scene, the sitting around the campfire farting scene. Now, <laughs> he said that was the first time a fart had ever been portrayed on camera and they wanted that removed, but he said, you know what, I knew if I put that in there and jacked up the volume that it would be one of the most memorable scenes, and it was. So, out here in Vasquez Rocks, what we're filming is right here, even though we've got some weird lighting, this is the rock that we see in the background when Gene Wilder, basically uh, the Waco kid, and the sheriff are coming to find out why Hedley Lamar has made him the sheriff and why they're so interested in Rock Ridge and what they find out as they're riding their horses down this trail, you can see this in the background, as they find out that the railroad is being built and it's gonna go right through Rock Ridge. Now the railroad, we actually see the railroad from out there. So we're gonna walk out there and show you where that shot was. Now Mel did want not only current actors, but he wanted some Western actors too, so he got Slim Pickens, who had been in like 150 movies, and they said when he showed up, he was a real cowboy. They said, this guy showed up in a Winnebago with his dog, and when everybody else went to their hotel at the end of the night, he set up a campfire and was sitting out there eating beans, camping out. So they said he offered a lot of wisdom on how to do a Western, but Mel Brooks told a funny story where he said he ran into John Wayne and said, you know, uh, John, I'd love you to be in this picture that I'm working on. And John said, is that the one that I heard that you guys are gonna say blow it out here? <gasps> yeah, we're gonna say that on a Western. And John Wayne said, oh, I can't be in a Western like that, but I'll be the first one in line to go see it. <laughs> 
So like I said, this was a racial comedy, not a racist comedy. So Mel Brooks has always kind of like had a real indifference because he doesn't like the TV version that they've released. He said it's unwatchable because he said they completely missed the point. He said the point in this movie was not to glorify the n-word or glorify racism or anything like that. He said it was just exactly the opposite. He said it was to poke fun at everybody and he said the point of this movie was to demonstrate the silliness of racism through the eyes of good people, not bad people. He said he always felt like it had been portrayed by bad people. And he said this time you had a town who were forced to have a black sheriff, someone that they didn't like and they didn't know why other than his skin color, and that they ha are forced to rely upon to save them. And so he said, in that instance, he said, Cleavon was actually great because he told all the actors, say whatever's funny. Don't worry if I would get offended or anything. We all know it's a movie. We all know what we're trying to do here. We're trying to expose the silliness of racism, so go with it. And there's a, actually like a really funny scene where you see Taggart talking to, uh, talking to his guy and he says, you know, we done cleared this land of all the Indians and here we got a sheriff whose skin's darker than theirs. I'm depressed. And as his buddy says, you want me to kill him for you? Would that cheer you up? I mean, it's like totally poking fun at the ridiculousness of it all. Now we will see this in the background of that shot when uh, you eventually see all, the, all of Taggart's men coming down the canyon and they meet up with the uh, the likes of all the African-American railroad workers as well as the Waco kid and the sheriff. And back when they filmed this, you can tell by the shots, this would have all been cleared out. It was all flat land, like all these bushes and stuff, you wouldn't have seen any of those. Now there actually are other scenes that were filmed in California. Um, you know, some of them at the Warner Brothers lot, obviously, because they poke that joke in the movie about them breaking into the soundstage that Dom DeLuise is working on. But they filmed some of it out in Palmdale and Lancaster, which is really hard to match up. And there's another scene out here where Harvey Corman gives a really great speech, but I don't know if we're going to be able to match that up today. Um, we'll try. We're going to look for it. It's a great scene. And Harvey Corman even said, he said, look, I know that, you know, a lot of people like me in this movie, but I was, I don't care what Mel says. I was not the first choice. I think Carl Reiner was the first choice because I'm never anybody's first choice. So like I said, this was all cleared away at the time, but this would have been the long range shot of the guys working on the railroad up through here. Cause you can see that little divot of, uh, of rock and then the rock that's actually over here you see that in the side and then you see this whole edge over here now what's pretty cool about this movie is it's went down to be like a total classic despite its controversial nature and even Madeline Kahn was nominated for Academy Award for it which Harvey Corman said is like almost unthinkable because he said even now like however many years later was it almost like over 40 years later you still don't see many comedies getting nominated for awards like that. And he said, Gene Wilder said, Mel Brooks all said, she might be the best actress. All three of them said they ever worked with. Um, they said she was more gifted than you know and she could turn anything into a comedy. Some of the things that weren't necessarily supposed to be funny in the script, she made funny. Now that scene I was telling you about where the the man Taggart is talking about how depressed he is because they went and done slaughtered everybody across the, the West and then they got to deal with this sheriff now. That scene would have been pretty much angled up right just like that. And that's where they have that whole scene of them telling them what they're going to do and this is also where the sheriff gets his idea. We're not going to give it up so lightly. We've got to come up with a plan. And he actually goes back, tells the city, tells the town people what they're going to do. And all of them decide they don't want to fight and they're going to give up. So he says, give me 24 hours to come up with a great plan or else, or else we can just give it up. And he comes up with a great plan of making a fake copy 
of their town rigged with dynamite. Brooks decided he's gonna try and uh, climb up the Vasquez rocks while we're out here checking it out. And there he goes, right over there. This day and age, it's almost unthinkable to imagine Blazing Saddles as being anything other than a Mel Brooks movie, but to know that it almost would have been an Alan Arkin movie. Crazy enough. I don't know. Just so weird. As a kid, I got... I didn't necessarily understand all the jokes, but I got the... Uh, sitting around the campfire scene, and I probably shouldn't even been watching that movie as a kid, but as an adult, one of the things that I think I find funniest about it is how they like to break that wall of letting you know that they're filming a movie. Like when they break into Dom DeLuise's set and Taggart runs up, and Dom DeLuise says, you can't come in here, this is a closed set, and <laughs> Taggart goes, Oh, pee off. I'm working for Mel Brooks. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's chock full of great moments. I mean, I, uh, it, it will always be a comedy classic and for good reason. You know, like I said, I, I think the, the message of the movie is important for everyone that, you know, to judge someone by their look or their skin color is underestimating everyone. Do you see Breck up there at the top? He's the one, uh, Pretty much on all fours like a mountain climber from Price is Right. He's working his way slowly to the very, very top right there. There he is. He's the star on the Christmas tree right now. You couldn't pay me enough to go stand up there. Not with my fear heights. Oh, and also, if you didn't see my friend Adam the Woo's video on the Star Trek Gorn episode on his Adam the Woo channel, go watch it, because that episode takes place out here at Vasquez Rocks, and Adam also climbs up to the side of that and shows the filming locations where Captain Kirk has his <sighs> legendary battle. How cool is that that we're literally walking through this set right now of Blazing Saddles? Literally, this all would have been cleared away. They would have used, they would have been riding the horses up and down here, the trail for the uh, the train track and everything, the trail that the horses take. Amazing. Ah, you gotta love filming history. All right, dude, good job. I have a question for you. How does it feel to have hiked up the rock formation that was in the background of Blazing Saddles? <laughs> and how was the hike? It, it was uh, it was actually a lot better than I thought it was going to be. It's pretty steep up there, but there isn't a lot of like loose rock or anything that you're going to slip on. You just got to uh, stay on hands and knees the whole time and kind of look for the least bad way up. Yeah, there was a lady down here that kept asking me questions, and then uh, I pointed up to you, and she's like, that's your friend? Oh, my God, I can't believe he's up there doing that. I would never do that. And I said, well, he seems to have a grip on it. That's right about the time you were uh, you were at the very, very point of it all so good job man well, the, the second i saw this place i knew i had to climb that there's just there's no other way around that that's just who i am and the uh the shirt was very appropriate for right? being out here in some place that looked that was actually portrayed as like outer space in star trek so and i just ran into a guy that works on movie sets and he was telling me that in the 90s he worked on star trek and he said they were out here all the time filming so they've used this pretty much the entire run of all the star trek series it, it doesn't surprise me it looks like an alien planet you know it's there's not, not a lot around here if you kind of don't look at the freeway over there and the houses up on the hill over there. You know, this could be mistaken for some weird alien planet. And on that note, caveman, we are out of here. Let's go. It's always amazing how little of a drive it is just to get out of the city and find great nature and find where Blazing Saddles was filmed. Well, my friends, that's going to do it for us. I want to thank Jeff Eltringham, Joni Griffin, and Kathleen Freeman for making contributions to my channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope this inspires you to go back and re-watch Blazing Saddles if it's been a while since you saw it. It's a really funny movie. It's a really funny movie, and it was made for a specific purpose, and I think it accomplished that purpose. So, have a great night. 
Remember that comedy is comedy, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Money, my fans on the street, that don't end, and you just gotta find something by three in the